Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. In a show of unity, the majority of the Muslim world has condemned not only the anti-Islamic statements by France's president, but also the brutal killings of French citizens in recent terror attacks. Over the past month, trust between Emmanuel Macron's government and France's Muslim community has been strained. Divisive statements and actions by Macron that many Muslims have spoken out against has created a tense atmosphere the country hasn't seen in years. Haider Abbasi explains. From Libya to Bangladesh, a wave of anger. At almost every rally, protesters burn Emmanuel Macron's portrait. They're united in their outrage at the French president. They believe he's insulted Islam and the founder of the religion, the Prophet Muhammad. So what exactly did Macron say? At the start of October, he gave a speech in Paris where he said this. L'Islam est une religion qui vit une crise aujourd'hui partout dans le monde. Nous ne voyons pas que dans notre pays. In the same speech, Macron promised to tackle what he called Islamist separatism in France and said that anyone who wants to become French must accept people's freedom to commit blasphemy. His government is planning to introduce a bill strengthening a law that separates religion and the state. The president says the change is aimed at what he calls growing radicalism in France. But Muslims there and elsewhere have accused Macron of stigmatizing their community and using divisive language. Two weeks later, tensions in France escalated. A teacher was beheaded outside his school after he showed his students caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad. His suspected attacker was shot dead by police. Muslims revere the Prophet and any visual depiction of him is forbidden. The French president has defended the teacher and the cartoons, which first appeared in the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. These caricatures portray the Prophet as a terrorist. As a tribute to the slain teacher, the cartoons are projected onto government buildings in two French cities. This provoked a backlash in Muslim countries, and some Muslims began calling for a boycott of all things French. It even caught the attention of heads of states. Islam ve Müslüman düşmanlığı kimi Avrupa ülkelerinde bizzat devlet başkanı seviyesinde teşvik edilen desteklenen bir politik haline gelmiştir. Irkçı terörizm. Şimdi buradan sesleniyorum. İşte siz gerçek manada faşistsiniz. Siz gerçek manada Nazi'nin adeta zincir halkalarısınız. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan himself has urged his citizens to boycott French goods. But Macron is refusing to concede. On Sunday, he tweeted, We will not give in, ever. We do not accept hate speech and defend reasonable debate. We will always be on the side of human dignity and universal values. Some analysts say Macron is pandering to the right as he looks towards the presidential election in 2022. But he is surely alienating French Muslims and damaging relations with Muslim states. Haider Abbasi, Straight Talk. And joining me now from Istanbul is Farid Hafez. He is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Salzburg and also from Istanbul, Ines Bayraklı, who is the Director of European Studies at the SETA Foundation. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. The rift between Muslim nations and our friends is growing after French President Emmanuel Macron said Islam is a religion in crisis all around the world. And then he pressed ahead uh, defending the publication of cartoons depicting their prophet Muhammad. So Farid, what does he have in his mind? Is he deliberately trying to be provocative? Well, I think it's a pushback and, and it's also um, kind of a distraction strategy um, because obviously the, the, the problems that Macron is currently facing and uh, the plans he is implementing is basically a crackdown on Muslim civil society. We have seen this more than 50 Muslim associations, including anti-racist associations, 
um, are under a track should be dissolved, according to the Ministry of Interior. This is just two months before uh, the so-called anti-separatism bill is planned to be debated in the national parliament. Mm. So I think uh, the whole debate about the cartoons now is basically a distraction from the real problems going on in terms of uh, structural racism. France seems to be rest wrestling with um, ensuring freedom of speech, even if it comes at the expense of defaming a religion, NS. Um, how can countries like France achieve to balance that? I think um, there is, uh, I mean, there are a lot of double standards here uh, that, that French uh, society and um, the state or the Macron demands that the Muslims accept that their prophet is insulted. But when it comes to other caricatures uh, or uh, harassment to other uh, groups, it is not tolerated. So it is expected uh, from Muslims to accept this kind of behavior, which is, uh, which is a double standard. On the other hand, um, as you mentioned, I mean that uh, the French state now wants to somehow um, interfere in the religious affairs of Muslim theological discussions and they wants to somehow reform Islam. Mm -hmm. But this is totally against uh, uh, the principle of secularism or laicite because as far as uh, I mean, we understand uh, or the, it's the, it's the expert's opinion, right? The laicite or secularism means that the state doesn't interfere with the religion and the religion doesn't interfere with the yes. state uh, affairs. Yeah. Uh, however, what we see is a, as a, as a, as a, is a, a direct uh, intervention from the French state to uh, to shape and or reshape uh, of the religion of Islam. And after his comments fired, many Muslim countries denounced France and decided to boycott French uh, products. What do you make of the international backlash and have those reactions served their purpose? Well, um, I'm not very optimistic and I also think that this is, I, I doubt that this is the way to go because um, first of all, what I see here there is a responsibility that lies first and foremost on behalf uh, of other European nation states. So I think uh, this whole uh, boycott um, movement has rather uh, strengthened the European ties within, uh, within, the Euro within Europe in order to support the French position. Mm -hmm. And it also helped Macron to really mobilize on behalf of freedom of speech. But uh, if we, again, if we go back the structural problem of racism that Muslims are facing, I doubt that this, this can be helped with uh, by, uh, by trying to rally uh, a protest against the French uh, government. Yeah, those unfortunate uh, comments unfortunately led to the Nice attack in which uh, three civilians were brutally uh, killed. Despite the current feud between Turkey and France, the Turkish foreign ministry uh, released a statement condemning the Nice attack. And at the on end of the uh, statement, Turkey says, as a country which fights against different sorts of terror and loses its citizens as a result of terrorism, we emphasize our solidarity with the French people, the residents of Nice in particular, against terrorism and violence. So, uh, Enes, is it likely after those brutal attacks, Macron could adopt a more conciliatory tone? And as for the France-Turkey relations, what would you say? Have they reached their rock bottom? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, let's look at uh, what happened in the last month in France. Like, in the last month, there were four terror attacks, two somehow ISIS-related, Right and two also far right related terror attacks. Mm -hmm. But what we see in the French media is all about the ISIL attacks, covered there, and then it is being instrumentalized by the Macron government to further alienate and marginalize uh, Muslim society and criminalize the Muslim civil society uh, NGOs and institutions. Of course, this is a this is a very worrying development because uh, if the French government and the Macron is sincere. Uh, it's in its goal to fight against radicalization, then it has to do it uh, against all kinds of radicalization. Yes. And we also see that there is a uh, there is a strong radicalization amongst the far right and that leads to also terror attacks. So by only focusing on Muslims, uh, this is uh, this is this is uh, I mean, associating the only Muslims and Islam with the terrorism. This is what is unacceptable. And I think this is the main problem. Here. Yeah, those caricatures were first published in 2006 by a Danish newspaper, Ilian Posten, sparking a wave of protests again 
around the world. But uh, then late uh, President Jacques Chirac had condemned decisions to reprint cartoons, including uh, the Prophet Muhammad, as an overt provocation. So Farid, how France uh, has come to this point? Well, I mean, I think uh, it is a manifestation of the situation, basically, that we that Muslims in, in France are are, are going through. Because, um, I mean, cartoons are there, and I fully defend also the right to to draw whatever people want to draw, but they're basically there to criticize those in power. I think what the problem that we are facing with these kinds of cartoons in this context, also with Charlie Hebdo, is that it is the most marginalized people that are criticized while there is a majority and people who are in a dominant position who draw and can mobilize this the freedom of speech uh, theme in order to strengthen their power and to further alienate uh, those already being marginalized. So mm -hmm. I don't see that the cartoon here really serves the purpose of really criticizing those in power, but it rather further reaffirms the power position of those who further marginalize the marginalized, racialized other, the Muslim people. But uh, what kind of mechanisms then in is, should be employed to fight anti-Islam sentiments and anti-Islam rhetoric, given that there are about 44 million Muslims living across Europe? Look, I mean, the Muslims, as, as Farid said, quite a weak minority in terms of economic power, political power, cultural power. I mean, Muslims are not even uh, even enough represented in the in the French Parliament. There are only eight Muslim uh, MPs in the uh, in the in the French Parliament. Although the eight percent, ten, almost until the ten percent of the population is Muslim, mm -hmm. so that uh, shows us that Muslims are quite a weak minority in France, and they don't have the, any means to fight against this uh, discrimination. And this is a, this is a quite big problem for Muslims. And uh, many many people they think that this is only about Islam and or, or the Muslims. No, I think this is a much bigger problem because um, that Muslims are used and Islamophobia is to further normalize the far-right discourse in all around Europe. And this is shifting the whole European politics towards uh, uh, far-right ideas and uh, rhetoric. Yeah. And at the end of the day, everybody is going to lose in Europe, not only Muslims. Uh, but uh, I think many people, they do not realize it, this, and they think this is the only Muslim's problem. But I don't think this is the, uh, the, the Muslim problem only. So Farid, what's the way out of this conundrum? Well, I think, first of all, people have to come to terms with their own history and with their own present. I mean, uh, France is a deeply a, is a post-colonial republic, right? Um, I think there are so many things that France has to tackle with in terms of the status quo, but it also in terms of the historical legacy. And people in, in, in Europe in general, specifically in Western Europe, have to come to terms with the fact that there is a massive problem with anti-Muslim racism. If this is not even recognized as a problem, then we are far away from even coming uh, coming to uh, to discuss about any kind of solutions. I mean, there are so many anti-racist uh, organizations and people who are standing on the right side who know what could be done. But I see that, that there is, in many European countries, and first and foremost France, that there is no political will to do that. All right, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Last year, Libya was in an all-out war with itself. Warlord Halifa Haftar, armed with Gulf weapons and money, launched a brutal assault to take Libya's capital, Tripoli. But that campaign failed and was marred by indiscriminate attacks on civilians that left hundreds dead and thousands displaced. But now there seems to be a sliver of hope. The Security Council has called on Libya's warring parties to come to a political solution after ratifying a UN-brokered ceasefire reached in Geneva. Libya's government of national accord, which is recognized internationally, has been battling Haftar's forces for more than a year. But since repelling his illegal militias from the capital, fighting has bogged down mostly into a stalemate. As part of the ceasefire, the warring sides agreed that foreign troops and mercenaries would leave. But Libya's defense minister said the ceasefire wouldn't affect the GNA's ties and cooperation with Turkey. 
So will this latest ceasefire hold and can Libya find a lasting political solution? And to answer that, joining me now from Ankara is Murat Aslan. He is a security analyst and a researcher at the SETA Foundation. And from Istanbul, Juma El Gamati. He is a Libyan academic and politician who heads the Tagir party in Libya and is a member of the UN-backed Libyan political dialogue process. So, gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Juma, is agreement holding so far and how it is different than the previous ones which were breached? <clears throat> Well, yes, the ceasefire agreement is holding. Uh, let's remember that there has not been any fighting for almost um, a few months now since the Haftar militias have been pushed back all the way to Sirt and Jufra. So in effect, what has been signed uh, uh, a few days ago is just uh, making it official what is uh, a de facto ceasefire. So, uh, so far, so good. Uh, uh, now that Haftar has or his representatives have agreed to sign this official ceasefire. This is a big shift on his side. Remember back in Moscow in January, yes. he refused to sign any ceasefire, whereas Sarraj uh, was happy to do so under the auspices and the guarantee of both Turkey and, the Soviet, and, and Russia. So now we see a big shift in, in Haftar's position. Obviously, after he was defeated heavily, uh, in his uh, war attempt to take yes. over power by force in Tripoli. So, yes, the ceasefire is holding. There has been no fighting for a few months now. Okay. Uh, Murat, Turkish President Erdogan questioned the viability of this agreement, uh, ceasefire, saying it was not made at the highest level. So, uh, he remains skeptical. Is he right to be suspicious of something or maybe warlord Halifa Haftar? Diplomatic agreements are always good, though, if it offers a kind of opportunity to ex exploit the situation, then question marks arise, as you know. So I think President Erdogan is really concerned if anybody in Libya will exploit the established uh, status quo mm -hmm. and actually very concerned about the outcomes after the dialogue forum is realized because current picture in this forum is 61% favoring Haftars. That means uh, President Erdogan is really focused on the outcomes mm -hmm. that will downgrade the position of Tripoli government. So have all sides, Juma, concerned been included in the process? Well, I think, I think um, there has been concerns and caution about the whether the, all the, um, the, the parts of the agreement will be implemented. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, implementation is the key word. And in this sense, uh, and in this regard, President Erdogan was absolutely right to, to highlight uh, caution and concerns that uh, it might not be implemented. Because one of the, the key things uh, it talks about this agreement is the withdrawal of all uh, foreign fighters. Mercen Yes. Yeah, all mercenaries and foreign fighters from Libya totally uh, removed from Libya within 60 days. Is it, now, is it viable? Is this viable? Is this timetable viable? And does it cover, for example, arms sales by other countries to Libya like the United Arab Emirates, France, Egypt and Russia? Well, well, well, the removal of foreign fighters and mercenaries will never be viable and it will never be implemented if Russia and the Emiratis do not deliver that. Because where do these mercenaries come from? Uh, almost over 3,000 are directly from Russia as Wagner mercenaries. Mm -hmm. uh, over 6,000 of them are Janjaweed from Sudan, which the Emiratis brought in to fight on Haftar's side, and the Emiratis pay for them. There are hundreds who are from Chad as well. So if these sponsor countries like the Russians, Russia and the Emiratis do not push and, and exert pressure to remove these fighters, then they will be, never be removed. Yes. I don't think Haftar has, Haftar does not have any control over these uh, mercenaries. Russia has a direct control over the Wagner fighters. So in a sense, we are dealing with Russia rather than dealing with Haftar, who is a mere proxy. So uh, Murat, how will this agreement impact Turkey's military cooperation uh, with the legitimate government? The uh, Ministry of Defense of Libyan state agreed that there will be no effect of these agreements upon Turkish-Libyan relationship. 
because currently there is an ongoing training process in Turkey and also Turkish officers in Libya are directly mentoring armed groups, mainly under GNA. Mm -hmm. uh, that means uh, there will be no effect on it. That, that Actually, it's from the Libyan side that they claim it. But on the other hand, this uh, forum that will be held uh, on 9th of November is very critical because they will take some decisions over there. And I do not know to what extent it will affect Turkish-Libyan relations so mm -hmm. I'm uh, optimistic, though. We must be cautious. So, uh, Juma, it's been reported that oil installations at Ras Lanuf and Sidar ports would be resume uh, output in a very short period of time. So how will oil revenues be distributed in this process? Well, uh, the same way as there have always been, the NOC, the National Oil Corporation, is the sovereign institution that's in charge of the whole oil sector in Libya, including production and export. The revenue of the oil exports goes first to an account uh, belonging to the Libya Foreign Bank, and then uh, within a few weeks after that, it goes straight to the central bank in, in Tripoli, which is the only Libya central bank that's recognized by the whole world. So there has not been any change in the mechanism so far. However, uh, I think this is a temporary arrangement. Uh, the, the, the, the resumption of oil exports is a welcome move. Now, production is up to a level of about 800,000 barrels a day. Uh, the normal level should be around 1.5 million. So we're almost, we're over half Mm -hmm. of the uh, of the normal level and uh, until until we have a, a comprehensive political agreement which tackles the issue of uh, revenue uh, of wealth distribution uh, then the mechanism is still the same and it has not changed and and, and it's in th the, the oil revenues oil export and revenues are managed by the legitimate gna government in mm -hmm. tripoli and the oil revenues go to the central bank in tripoli so juma uh how could Sarai's resignation impact this process? We know that the High Council of State and House of Representatives have both called on Sarai uh, to delay his resignations. Uh, what will he do if he resigns? Who is going to replace him? Very shortly, please. Well, he's not going to leave office until there is an agreement out of the political uh, process or dialogue that's going to start officially in Tunisia in about uh, 10 days. On November 9th, the Libya Political Dialogue Forum will start officially. It might go on for a couple of weeks or a bit more. Hopefully, it will reach a comprehensive agreement on the next stage in Libya, including a replacement of Sarraj and his colleagues with a new presidential council of three members only and a separate prime minister. So Sarraj will remain in office and will remain in charge until a replacement body has been named out of the Libya dialogue process, and then that that the new body or the new names will be will have the legitimacy to take over from Sarraj. Yeah. So we know that Turkey is cautious towards this agreement, but on the other hand, Russia has not yet officially weighed in on this ceasefire. What are Moscow's expectations from this process? There are many question marks for the Russian side because first they reject the presence of Russian soldiers on the ground. On the other hand, Wagner Group is clearly a Russian state-controlled organization in the form of a private military company. Uh, then any political attempt to marginalize foreign fighters will be repelled or maybe subjected to further rules by Russians. That, that's, that's an expectation. On the other hand, Russia wants to be at the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, and Libya will be the second leg of the overall Russian strategy. I do not think that they will not give up from the Libyan theater unless they are forced or there is no excuse state to stay, you know, in Libya. Yes. Uh, so, so we will see. We will see, though. Uh, I'm not that much optimistic for the Russian tendency to leave Libya. Once they step up, that means they will prefer to stay over there. So, Juma, last question. Are you hopeful that peace will be restored in your country in a short time? Well, I cannot be entirely hopeful. I'm reasonably optimistic uh, that um, there is enough uh, international will uh, to support an outcome by the Libyan uh, group that will meet in Tunisia, 75 of them, and that if they reach a political agreement, 
uh, to take us to the next stage, which hopefully will lead to elections in about a year and a half, then uh, the international community will endorse that agreement and will support it, and it will ensure that it is implemented. Unless there is th there is that international agreement, that there is international support, and that the, the international community will underpin and guarantee the implementation of any agreement, then unfortunately, uh, I cannot be very optimistic. All right, gentlemen. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subarkash. If you've got any comments, follow us and tweet us at Straight Talk TRT. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.